Welcome to the show. Today, we're going to unravel the mysteries of high-dose vitamin C and uncover the truth behind its transformative potential. Let's get started, Dr. Hart. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about vitamin C today and all the ways we use it. It's kind of an easy topic to talk about on one hand, but also at the same time, extremely complex. And I've always noticed that. It's kind of fascinating. It's, it's so ubiquitous and we think we understand its uses, but our Western medical models just barely started to scratch the surface after 80 years of, of research. It's so true. I mean, you know, we've been using it in medicine for so long. People think just take a little vitamin C. It's going to be great. And so we've kind of overlooked it now because of that. And when really, and we, we were even shown this during the pandemic, how powerful it still is and always has been. It reminds me a little bit of like ozone and UVB and, and how we talked in a previous episode that it was used really quite as the primary mainstay of treatment until uh, antibiotics came along, mostly in the 50s. But uh, Linus Pauling, you know, still to this day, the Linus Pauling Institute does everything it can to try to educate the public, lay people, professionals, health organizations at the power of supraphysiologic doses of vitamin C. Why, why hasn't it caught on? I, I was shocked to see even after the pandemic, if we couldn't turn and talk about that during the pandemic, when when are we going to wake up and actually know as a society that vitamin C can be used to treat so many ailments, illnesses, conditions, deficiencies? Well, I think I think you get the big three, right? It doesn't make anybody enough money. Okay. You get you get the kind of the mainstream medicine or the mainstream institutions pushing back against it. And then the third one is it's just not sexy enough. You know, the average consumer even healthcare consumers kind of going, I really want the new fancy thing. And while you and I both love ivermectin, which was kind of the, the fancy thing, the, the sexy thing during the, which was its old school remedy, even itself, vitamin C was often overlooked because it's, it's been around so long. It seems so kind of mundane. Yeah, but there seems like there are a lot of logistical barriers too. Like I, I think a lot of providers were afraid to even bring up to hospital boards, hey, our hands are tied. We're not really doing anything for these people. The vaccine hadn't been invented. No one knew if it would. No one knew at the time if it was going to be more dangerous, less dangerous. Why wasn't it ever a discussion? I mean, even in like a some part of the country, rural, urban, there's got to be some settings where a healthcare system has the, the foresight, the wisdom and the presence of mind during an emergency, like what we all live through, to make that treatment available, because all decisions, it comes down to risk reward. And this is a no brainer. Oh, yeah. And that's yeah, a biggie. I, yeah. Well, I get it fired up about it, because I strongly believe, as I'm sure you do, it would have saved lives. Oh, yeah. It's, I, mean, I think grassroots guys were like us were using it and were saving lives in that front. And we could have, if it was even minutely taken mainstream, it could have made a game changer. Yeah. And I mean, it, it makes you wonder if people actually go out of their way to, to block these. I mean, that's something we hear a lot on the internet, but uh, it was, it was hard to watch people suffer with very few options. And then as if that wasn't bad enough, the insult to injury was you can't even get in there to visit them. So there was no chance of you even bringing it in as an outside source. Yeah. Even if they could, they could still take by mouth or something like that. How does it? Raise a lot of questions, doesn't it? Face more suspicions yeah. than it does confidence. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe if let's we talk a little bit about how it helps, why it helps, when it helps how to take it, different routes of administration, we'll get a clearer understanding of that. Yeah, well, I think one route that it really helps, and I, I want to bring this one up because you kind of talked about even the rural areas, and this one is in some of the, the more remote areas where you've got kind of the country family doctor who's doing whatever he wants because he's out in the middle of nowhere. Some of those guys who deal with snake bites, spider bites, things like that, they find the high dose it, either oral, but especially I, IV vitamin C, a lot of times can save somebody from a venomous steak or a 
spider bite, even if they don't have the anti-venom. And so that's one route very quickly that I find that kind of ties in what you're talking about, but is a great administrative tool on that front. How, how do you use it in your practice? Yeah, as an antioxidant on one hand, so to help clean up free radicals and somebody's got poor detoxification, that's a biggie. And so we'll either do intravenous if somebody's either needs really high doses or is just that depleted, or we'll do high dose oral and take them up to bile tolerance with either liposomal or buffered C. There's also a pretty good topical use of vitamin C. There's a lot of vitamin C paste, vitamin C rubs, antimicrobial, antifungal. It is a, an acid, ascorbic acid. It doesn't feel good if you put powder directly in an open wound. I think it's yeah. a good topic for maybe a movie on torture. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it is, it is a very, when it's unbuffered, like you said, it can be very uh, acidic. If it leaks by an IV, for instance, it can sting in the tissues. That doesn't necessarily suggest its reactive potential, but that's been pretty well known and well established. And I had notes, but I'm going from memory. I think Linus Pauling suggested it was either two or 3,000 milligrams a day. That was his estimate on a recommended daily allowance because, as we've talked about before, a lot of those were just for men during the war to, to, to yeah. stave off whatever illness the deficiency caused. So you yeah. have like deficiency maintenance, normal maintenance, and then the super physiologic dosing. Yeah. So Linus Pauling, Pauling was a researcher who helped discover the molecule of vitamin C. And uh, one of the things he did and realized is that most mammals, their liver makes vitamin C, ascorbic acid for them. Right. And we don't have that benefit. And so he kind of, he kind of gave a low ball recommendation, I think, because he wanted to stay off of being too much, too controversial. He wasn't too afraid of that. He himself, I think, took more like 10 to 12 grams or 10 to 12,000 milligrams a day pretty consistently as his personal dose. Yeah, and he got famous in his own lifetime because he, of course, won the Nobel Prize, but eventually kind of became the father of orthomolecular medicine mm -hmm. and really figured out at super physiologic doses, this is a different, this is a game changer. Like this is a different uh, bear altogether. And I certainly see that clinically. It's what I don't see is scurvy and things like that, that we might've seen 50 or hundred years ago. Uh, fortunately, I think a lot of people don't understand that concept. Like, well, am I deficient? It, it, it may not be a question of deficiency because super physiologic doses are much, much higher than the body. Like you said, would in a mammal might generate from the liver or that we need for normal you know, basic functioning. Um, I think that uh, a lot of people have absorption issues too. So depending on what you're treating, the route of administration is going to be really important, right? If it's something topical, you're obviously going to yeah. go topical. There's a lot of paste and creams and stuff like that that contain, among other things, vitamin C. Intramuscular doesn't happen for the reasons mentioned before, but yeah. oral, which like you said, buffered or unbuffered, it can be taken in a liposomal form, which helps protect it to get absorbed better in the gut and get in the blood where it can, like you said, fight off oxidative stress and reactive species, very antiseptic. One thing that's kind of neat at the IV high levels of and I don't know who first discovered this, but it's been known at least since the 90s that it itself can act as a chelator for metals. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, it can protect you from the oxidative stress of a burden like a metal or a mold or whatever. It uh, can also work that much deeper on a deeper level. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. And so, you know, the key here, I think what you and I are talking about is there's deficiency, which almost doesn't happen, at least in North America, North America. And at normal levels, it does works the immune system. It makes white blood cells work. It makes the connective tissue and collagen work, right? Wound healing, repair on that front. Very, very important. It's a cofactor for lots of enzymes, breaking down dopamine, 
breaking down histamine, making DAO work, breaking down stress, neurotransmitters, all those. So that's what it does at normal levels. We're talking about when somebody's got an issue and we want to use vitamin C at such a high dose that it has a different therapeutic value, right? So we know, like for instance, that some of the doses you and I are talking about, what it can do is a, as a, a chelator, also it can make its own interferon. Right. So when it gets high enough level, it doesn't just help the white blood cells make interferon to fight infections. Because what do we think of interferon? You think of treating hepatitis in the liver, right? Hepatitis C, I think typically you might use interferon for. Well, high dose vitamin C will make its own interferon in the body in order to fight those viruses and bacteria and invaders. And so that doesn't happen at 100 or 200 milligrams, right? But you can create that super physiological or that hyper therapeutic dose at a thousand plus 2000, 50,000 milligrams in a day to create that extra interferon, for example. Yeah. And like you were saying, Linus Pauling personally might've taken up to 10 grams a day. Typical treatment courses for the IV can be anywhere from 10, 12 to to hundred plus. One, you know, I ran into an interesting situation yesterday <laughs> Uh, and maybe this is just that constant moving boundary between East and West medicine and the whole integrative approach. But I had someone who had a kidney stone wanting to come in for vitamin C the day before going for lithotripsy. And the two halves of my brain were fighting each other because I knew vitamin C is a good treatment, but I knew Western medicine would say vitamin C is a good cause of yeah kidney stones. And so purely for medical legal reasons, I suggested that she hold off until after the procedure. When I, when in reality, I knew what was clinically best, if I could, you know, let her see in my mind, it would be to treat it and it might come out on its own, you know, with, with that and a little Toradol or something. What's, you know, I think sometimes like that's, that's a good point is to say, you know, Western medicine doesn't really differentiate between true causes and irritants, right? So we know vitamin C can irritate oxalates at high doses, which oxalates are what, they're what kidney stones are made of is oxalates. But we also know things like vitamin C, high dose citric acid, herbs like chanka pager, they can break it down. And so, but unfortunately you have to play the game, right? Because, uh, because when you're dealing with Western medicine, you've got to play the game for them. So it's hard like that, but what's one other contraindication for high dose IVIC or IVC? That's a good question. Are you tricking me right now? I do not see, I mean, some people will be a little cautious with, with advanced renal disease. And again, that data, depending where you're looking is conflicting, but I think why it's such a great topic to talk about is because it's almost ubiquitously safe for so many people, so many ages, so many level of disease, that uh, it, it's as close to a panacea as any supplement or medicine that I could think of. I, I don't I think of anything else outpaces it. Like we're talking about different routes of administration, different yeah. mechanisms of action, different effects. Another fun one I like to do is people with slow gut motility, you know, so many things affect gut motility. Certainly most pharmaceuticals do, classic ones too. Some of the worst are the opiates. And I remind people our gut is mucosa, just like our skin. If you've got a sock in the same place on your skin all day, it leaves a little indentation. It leaves an imprint that it was there. It changes the, the local tissue. It causes redness and inflammation. And if you left it long enough, it would continue to fester and eventually into a wound. And I remind people, that's what our guts are like. And so yeah. if you're eating food that's, you know, especially meats and things like that, that have more oxidative stress as they decompose, because that's what they're doing, you're going to get more of a sock line. You're going to get more irritation and you're going to, you know, eventually undo constipation by manifesting this new illness and so people who i hear that, that are constipated i'm like you're lucky that you can take pure vitamin c and yeah. use it as a as a laxative it flushes okay. people out nicely yeah and then you're able to tolerate higher doses 
it's kind of a win-win scenario. It's always push-pull with most decisions. This one's like, hey, your gut's messed up. Vitamin C is not only going to speed it up, get the toxins out, but it's going to repair that stress and endothelial damage. And it's pretty, it's pretty cool that the different routes of you know administration have different effects like that and can be used clinically different. So talking about the different routes, I know you know orally, especially because of that that flushing effect that when you get too high, you just poop it out, you just urinate it out. I do like, uh, I think. When you guys get pretty high, like closer to 50 or 100, do you guys ever run a, a G6P, like a glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase test? We do over 50 grams. 50, yeah. I've seen some clinics do it over 25. I don't know why, because there's not really a medical legal thing that's any different, 25 versus 50. Baseline labs can be helpful. Kidney function can be helpful, but definitely a G6PD over 50 grams. Because that affects how they how they metabolize the vitamin C. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I like that idea. Do you have some contraindications? I think that's about it. So if somebody's really acidic, you know, I always try to make sure I buffer it just so they're not Definitely. all irritated, like especially during a high high dose vitamin C IV uh, intravenous, because you know that's systemic. But uh, that's the only biggie. Just make sure it's buffered. It's my big one. Or if they've got a corn sensitivity, some of those folks sometimes have a hard time with it, but sometimes you can find non-corn sources for the IV. Another great use of vitamin C is for, through nebulizing. You know, we were talking to you before when we were talking about the pandemic, we were talking about ICU patients, people who were really up the, up against the wall and had that sort of Hail Mary, well, we don't know what to do with you, the sickest of the sick. That yeah. should have been the time to stop, start thinking outside the box. It was interesting, and I think it was a Chinese study in December, before the before it showed its ugly surface or its ugly head in, in this country anyway. And they were talking about nebulized vitamin C. So a yeah. lot of the active lung diseases, you could nebulize vitamin C, get vitamin C into your airway, into the mucosa of the respiratory tree. And it was directly on site, you know, applied to the tissues that are just sitting there being sizzled by the virus and the immune response. That was a really, between that and silver, that was really important direct application through inhalation. Also really great for mucus in the sinuses, yeah. sinus disease, sinus surgery, wound healing, like you said. That I recommend a ton. And we have a little recipe for that as well. What have you seen with cancer? You know, Linus Pauling talked a lot about the application of vitamin C in cancer. I usually see treatment protocols, depends on the type of cancer, between 50 and 100 grams. So most people with cancer who are either using it as complementary to Western care or alternative, they're all getting the G6 PDs and we're targeting that. It depends if SOT is involved. It depends, like you said, the type of cancer, their level of comfort, familiarity with it, availability because yeah. it's better to increase frequency when you have an aggressive tumor. Route of administration, tumors that are really hard to get to, really bloody, really nasty, you might think a lot more about IV versus a combination of IV and PO, just maybe as a, a bowel or rectal tumor. I've even heard of people doing rectal or vitamin C. Oh yeah, I love, I love that front end. Part of the reason why I think that a couple of reasons work so well, number one, of course, it's, it's high dose free radical action, but uh, vitamin C as a molecule looks exactly, not exactly like, but very close to sugar, right? To glucose. And so the, uh, the body, when the tumors are active, they're, they're like diabetics, like sugar hounds sucking that stuff up. And so they'll suck up that vitamin C and then create like an apoptotic effect inside there where it gets sucked up in there. And it's cleaning up the free radicals, cleaning up the damage. And at that high dose, right, like we're talking about very high dosage, 
actually has a killing effect between the interferon it produces, the white blood cell action, neutrophil action it has in there, clearing that tumor cell. out. Now, we would not say necessarily that it's a, it's a treatment because we're not trying to treat, diagnose, or cure anything on this podcast, just informational. But what the research shows is that it is highly taken up by those cancer cells and does help to kill them from the inside out. Yeah, and that's, you know, again, risk reward. That's pretty exciting stuff. You have to be a little cautious if they're doing concurrent chemotherapy because yeah. vitamin C is so powerful. It can inactivate not only chemotherapy, anesthesia. So we coordinate that, if especially yeah. if that's a friendly oncologist uh, <laughs> yeah. to, yeah, to yeah. integrative help. The other thing that can be beneficial in those patients is DMSO can help yeah. penetrate some of the more difficult, you know, maybe a brain tumor, for instance, where you're having to get across the blood brain barrier, having to, you know, permeate that actual tissue to get vitamin C, for instance, or the chemotherapy for that matter. Yeah. Into where it needs to go. That that can be another tool. And then really, you know, supporting the the he- the healing process. So that's decreasing inflammation while you said at the same time triggering uh, cell death and ultimately tumor death. That to me was probably the most exciting research that Linus Pauling did in his lifetime was on vitamin C and cancer. Yeah, now that's, it's pretty incredible when you do that on the front, but like the recovery period, post-surgical, et cetera, or even what I've had some patients do working with their oncologist say, okay, you know, when's your chemo, if it's not a daily chemo, when's your chemo getting administered? Okay. Then three days after that, let's hit it with vitamin C. So give it those three days because it, it, and it, it, what those cases found on my perspective is that they have a lot less side effects from the chemo, right? The chemo is not damaging all those clean cells because you're keeping them protected with vitamin C and research shows as well, vitamin C from different infections, it'll protect your white blood cells that are probably getting attacked, right? Because when, when you're fighting infection, they're making all sorts of free radicals and those free radicals can irritate them as well, irritate your healthy cells. And so you need something to protect them. So vitamin C can protect your cells from chemo, can protect your cells and your white blood cells from their own actions or exogenous actions. So it's pretty incredible at high dose. Anything else you've used vitamin C for in your practice? How about its role specifically in mold and Lyme? How do you utilize vitamin C in treating those patients? And is it treating more of the infectious agent or is it treating more of the inflammation or free radical damage, oxidative stress? Yeah, all the above in the disease process, right? So initially, any toxin that comes into your system, like a mold toxin or a biotoxin from Lyme, for instance, those are they're causing free radical damage. That's how they poison the system to a major degree. And so vitamin C helps protect that on that front. And also on a detoxification front, because we need to detoxify those out, it helps to replenish mold, replenish glutathione, right? Glutathione needs to be recharged due to electrons. And vitamin C is one of the few pure antioxidants in the world. You know, this is a good segment to say things like green tea, et cetera, what we call antioxidants are not really antioxidants. They're weak, Proxidants. They irritate the cell to make its own antioxidants. Vitamin C is a true electron donor. It's a true antioxidant. So it recharges glutathione. So it helps us detoxify things like mycotoxins, mold toxins, which gets depleted. And then a biggie on that front, on both those issues, mold and Lyme, is the damage to connective tissue, the, inflam- the inflammatory cascade and the direct damage to connective tissue and collagen needs to be cleaned up. And vitamin C helps to repair that because it's needed to repair connective tissue, needed to repair collagen. And so vitamin C really, it acts directly on the irritants, the mold and the lime. It helps to clean up our cells and protect our cells and replenish them for the fight, the immune system, the detoxification pathways, and it helps to clean up the damage they've done. And so you can use it really pretty safely, I found, at all phases of care. You know, immediate, when you're when somebody's so sensitive and reactive, the in-between when you're really fighting a good fight, and then towards the end, when you're cleaning up their damage and doing the repairs. Dr. Hart, as always, thank you for your knowledge and experience. Join us next week. You guys take care. Thanks, Dr. Mark. Thank you. Be well. Be well. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs>